Sardis. What a mess. But God is awesome, isn't he? And even great words of truth. And I'm so thankful that Don is with us tonight to help us unravel this uh, mysterious verse. It's really not a mystery at all if we just let the word speak and we'll find the answers in it. So would you please welcome back Don Stewart. Thank you. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Had a good Easter, huh? The Lord is risen. Thank you. All right. Somebody's got the Lord is risen indeed. That's right. And, and it's good. Uh, yeah, we will finish Sardis tonight, guaranteed. Um, and, and well, here's, here's the reason why this takes so long. Every verse or every phrase, every illustration has a background in at least the Old Testament, possibly the words of Jesus, the letters of the Apostle Paul, uh, something locally that's happening in the city, something that has happened in the city, or something that will happen further in the book of Revelation. That's why there's so much there. So just, just to let you know, we're not just doing this to kill time. There's just so much there in each, each of these things. Like, again, these six verses, I'm up to 35 pages on it, but I've stopped, I'm stopping tonight, and we're all, well, we get done. All right, the letter to the church of Sardis. We're going to read it here, uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1, just to remind you what we've had so far. It says, unto the angel or the messenger of the church of Sardis, you write this. This is the solemn pronouncement of the one that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know what you're doing. You have a reputation that you are alive, but you are dead. Become watchful and strengthen the remaining things which are about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete or fulfilled in the presence of my God. Therefore, remember how you received and heard and observe and repent. Therefore, if you do not watch, I will come to you as a thief. And there is no way on earth you will know what sort of hour, what sort of time I shall come upon you. But you have a few people in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white because they are worthy. The one who overcomes... This one will be clothed in white garments, and there is no way his name shall be erased or wiped out of the book of life. And I will confess his name in the presence of my Father and before his angels. The one who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And dear God, help us you know, understand and hear what this wonderful, wonderful book says. Even though this is, like we said, a church where nothing at all is good said about them. And again, to summarize, um, they're the worst of the seven churches because they have a reputation. Laodicea didn't even have a reputation. They had one, but they weren't living up to it, and they weren't who the world thought they were. However, we're to the promises now, because they were told to watch because of the history of the city, the times it got taken by uh, uh, armies when the city was impregnable, and now we're talking the promises to those, the few names, the few people in Sardis who have not, you know, defiled their garments. And we have this interesting promise here in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5, which says they will, they will be clothed in white garments. That's what they're told. And there is no way, no way, the Lord says, I will ever erase, no, not ever strike their name out of the book of life. I will not strike his name out of the book of life to the one that overcomes. All right, this is the strongest way of, of emphasizing something in Greek. We had it earlier uh, where he said, you don't know, you'll never know what sort of hour I'll come. You won't have any idea. Well, there's no way. Their name's going to be struck out of the book of life. All right, what does all this mean? This is a question we get asked all the time on the radio and many people ask. All right, let's look at a few things. Number one, can we all agree, since God is all-knowing, he doesn't have to write things down, right? Okay, he doesn't have to keep a book to, to, like we do to remember things or keep a diary, as it were. So people keep books for later recollection, of course. So this is a figure of speech. It's an instance of God using a human device so we can understand the message better. So this is what it's talking about. And the Bible actually mentions a number of books. So what is, what is the book of life? All right, uh, the books that God keeps, there appear to be a number of them illustrated in Scripture. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 tells us this, where it says, I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And notice what it says, and the books, books were open, books, plural. All right, so what are they? All right, there's at least 
three different ones, probably four different types of books. This is where confusion arises. The first is we call the book of the living, the book of those who are alive. Now, this is a book of people who are alive at one particular time in history. In the book of Exodus, chapter 32 and verse 32, uh, we read about Moses. Remember the story of Moses? Um, God saw the people. They, he, Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and he had the, uh, the Ten Commandments, and the people were making the golden calf and that, and God wanted to wipe them out. And um, the Lord says, they're a stiff-necked people. I want to, you know, I'm going to just destroy them. And in verse 32 of Exodus 32, he says, but Moses then says, but now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, wipe me out from your book that you have written. In other words, Moses, wipe me out from the book because the Lord basically said, I'm going to wipe all the people out and start all over with Moses. I'm going to kill them all. And I'm going to just start with you. And Moses says, no, if you won't forgive them, wipe me out from the book too. And then the Lord says, whoever sinned against me, that person I will wipe out of my book. So this is referring to a book of a ledger. People were alive at one particular time. All right. Uh, we've got other illustrations of that in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 20, it talks about the Lord blotting out the names uh, of those un from under heaven. And again, blotting out the names in the sense he puts them to death. And so this is the book of the people that are alive, and oftentimes God will, you know, uh, threaten judgment against these people. And so they are basically the living who will be blotted out or die. Psalm 69 verses 27 and 28 says the same thing. The psalmist says, Hold them accountable for all their sins. Do not vindicate them. May their names be deleted from the scroll of the living. All right. In other words, we've got one book here that's talking about people who are alive physically, you know, righteous and unrighteous. And so whether they're, you know, believers or unbelievers really doesn't matter. One book is the scroll of the living. And there's other illustrations of that. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 3. We just don't have to read this. But here's, here's what's interesting. And again, the illustration that makes sense to the people at this particular time in Sardis. Practically every city in that era maintained a role or a civic register of its citizens. They, in other words, the name of every citizen was written down and the name of every child born in that city. If one of the persons in that city was guilty of treachery, all right, uh, brought shame on the city, their name would be removed from the ledger, as it were. Uh, public dishonor, their name would be purged from the ledger. And of course, when someone died, they would be removed from the ledger. So one illustration is the people who are alive, uh, the evil people who have done things, you know, again, in a particular city or in the Bible against the Lord, their names are purged. That's one way to, the book is used. It's also a second way we see it in the Bible. It's the name of the lost and their deeds. And this is the passage we just read in the book of Revelation, chapter 20 and verse 12. And it's interesting here when we read this verse, uh, John says, I saw the dead. Uh, the great and the small, standing in the presence of the throne, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, the one of life, and the dead were judged out of the things written in the books according to their deeds. All right, so it seems now we've not only got the book of life, we've got the book of deeds, and this is the deeds. The Lord keeps a record of all the evil things that unbelievers have done. Now, when we, here's the good news. When we come to Christ, our ledger is erased. Isn't that nice to know? Yeah, all right. <laughs> Amen. But the, believer, the unbelievers have a ledger there of all the things they've ever done, thought, or done, and they're going to be judged out of that to see how they, how they compete. And they don't do real well, do they? I mean, when God demands a 1,000% perfection. And so the book of deeds are the book, uh, this is distinguished from the book of life. The book of deeds are the written down, the, book, the deeds of the unbelievers, and they'll ju be judged by that because their name's not written in the book of life. All right, the third book is the book of life, and that's the name now of all the believers. So the first book is the registry of everyone alive. The second book is a book of, of, of deeds for the unbelievers. And the third book is the book of life, which we have here in Revelation 3, 5, which also is mentioned in other places in Scripture. Uh, Daniel 12, 1, it talks about those who will escape. Their names are found written in the book. Revelation 13, 8, we're going to come across, remember, everything we see here, we're going to come across that in the future in the book of Revelation. They worshiped him, it says, all the ones who dwell upon the earth, who were not, whose names was not written in the book of life of the Lamb um, that was slain, and the book uh, from the found, since written since the foundation of the world. 
And so Revelation 17.8 and 13.8 both say the same thing, that these names talk about people written in the book of life, which was written from the foundation of the world. All right, and then again, that terrible phrase for these people in Revelation 20.15, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And they're outside of the holy city. Uh, the only ones in the holy city are those whose names are written in the book of, the li book of life of the Lamb, Revelation 21.27. So basically, you have the Bible mentioning the book of the living, then at the judgment, the book of the deeds of the unrighteous dead, the book of life, which is just the names of the righteous dead. Why just the names? Because we have no sin, because he became sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5, right? He is the sin offering for us. That's why we're seen as perfect, because we're seen that little word in Christ. Hallelujah for that. Uh, there's a possibly a fourth book, uh, and that's the book of the names of the faithful followers of the Lord. Some people see that in Scripture. May or may not be, but it's uh, Malachi 3.16 talks about a scroll was prepared before him in which names were recorded of those who respected the Lord and honored his name. And there's a couple passages that may refer to a separate book. But again, God doesn't need a book. Remember, he doesn't write it down. The illustration is this. God keeps a record, and the records will be open. And this will be the, the records from what we're rewarded from. So on the one hand, this fourth book, I guess, would be the record of our deeds that don't burn up. Uh, for wood, hay, and stubble as Christians. In other words, when we receive our rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment seat's the reward seat, right? Judgment is not condemnation. The Greek word, like the English word, judge, means either reward or condemn, depending on the context. For Christians, judgment day is reward day. And so there would be a book of our deeds. Hallelujah for that. So that would probably be the fourth book, the faithful followers of the Lord, the deeds that will follow us. So again, four basic books in Scripture. The one book is just a book of the people alive at one particular time that God threatened to wipe out there with Moses and Exodus. Then the, the deeds of the unbelievers are written down, the book of life, the names of the believers and the names alone, and finally a book where we'll be rewarded out of, and that is the books of our works. Okay? Now, having said that, what does it mean he won't erase their name? All right, from the book of life. Does this mean others will have their name erased? All right, there's a couple ways of looking at this. First of all, it is possible, and this is one way of looking at it, and we do have this here, is a figure of speech. Now, the figure of speech is spelled L-I-T-O-T-E-S, L-I-T-O-T-E-S, and it's pronounced lie to tease, lie to tease, like someone's lying to tease somebody, lie to tease. All right. Here's a figure of speech that we all use. You probably didn't know it was called lightities, but now you will realize this. It's basically an understatement in which an affirmative is expressed by the negative. In other words, well, she's not a bad singer. Means what? She's a good singer. All right. Um, that guy, he's not unhappy, meaning he's happy, right? Um, there was one that many of you will appreciate. This was in the, the dictionary here of the Lightetes. Are you aware, Mrs. Bueller, that Ferris does not have what we would consider to be an exemplary attendance record? Um, that's from the movies Ferris Bueller's Day Off in 1986 from the principal, Ed Rooney. He does not have what we consider to be an exemplary attendance record, meaning what? Yeah, he's, he's, yeah, never there. True one. Okay. We have biblical examples of this, too. And again, it's saying the negative to accentuate the positive. We all do it. Someone hits one out of the park in a baseball game. Not bad, meaning very good, right? And so by saying the negative, you're emphasizing the positive. So in, if this is what's going on here, when it says their names will not be erased, that means this, what the Message Bible says is the best way of putting it, their names are indelibly written. Their names are indelibly written. So basically, it's saying a negative to express just the opposite. And so what the Lord says, the overcomer, there's, when he said that no way I'll wipe their names out of the book of life or erase them, that means they're indelibly written in there. Now, again, as we talked about before, this is not a threat. This is a promise to believers. We have to see it in the context as a promise. And if we do this, it's one of the three promises made to the overcomers here. Their names are indelibly written in the book of life. But now, so why did he use this illustration? Now, here's where I think 
knowing what's going on really, really, really is going to help make sense here. And this, this is kind of where the old light bulb came on for me. So follow me here with this, because I think the answer is found in the contemporary background of what was going on in Asia Minor at that time, and in particular at the church here in Sardis. All right, the present context seems to contain an allusion to some contemporary threat to the faithful few in the church. And it seemingly came from a, th a thing what we'll put up on the, on the screen in a few minutes called the Curse of the Minim, M-I-N-I-M, Minim, and mean, uh, min is, uh, means kind, you know, after they're kind in Hebrew, Minim means the plural for the kinds. All right, what's going on? How do we understand this? All right, at the end of the first century here, the climate was getting increasingly difficult for the Jews, Jewish believers in Christ. The Romans were losing their confidence in the Jews with rebellion in Palestine. Remember, you had the war in AD 66, the Jewish war, that eventually the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, and the mass suicide in Masada in AD 72. So the Romans are getting a little bit nervous with the Jewish people in the Roman Empire at that time. Now, add to this, the Jews were concerned with the inroads this new faith in the Nazarene was making in their own ranks. Many Jews were coming to faith in the Nazarene. That's what they called Christians, the sect of the Nazarene, believing in Jesus. What was happening at the same time is Christians were still going to the synagogue. They were still identifying with the synagogue at the same time the Jewish Christians were. And this was becoming more and more bothersome to the Jews. Now, the hostility was increasing because the Jews did not want them to be identified with the synagogue. So, AD 90 comes around, right before this letter was written, and a document was produced by the Jews called the Curse of the Menim, and it seems to be an official document to divest from the synagogue worship the Christians who claim to still be Jews, because they're Jews, but now they're Jews believing in Jesus, and they're actually in the synagogue with the people identifying with them, also identifying with the Christian church. They hadn't totally broken from the synagogue. All right, so here's the timing of the curse, what's going on. After the issuing of the curse in AD 90, Emperor Domitian, remember we talked about him at the beginning, uh, not a real nice character, he started intensifying his determination to extend emperor worship and to stop all unruly elements in his empire. But this left the Christians in a serious predicament, all right? While they'd never been, they'd never been granted the, the status of an approved faith, the, the, the Christians were seen as a subset, because most of them were Jews at the beginning, a subset of Judaism. And Jews had a special exemption in the Roman Empire. They didn't have to bow to Caesar. So the Christians going to the synagogue were exempt from that. You know, they can get away with that. But now the Jews want to push the Christians out of the synagogue. And Domitian now wants to make sure that everybody in the emperor, empire starts bowing to him. And, and what they wanted to do is uh, get rid of the Christians. And the curse of the Menim figured to bring that about. So they, the Jewish Christians found themselves two unhappy alternatives, embracing Judaism, sticking with the synagogue and denying Christ, or otherwise prepare for persecution at the hands of both the Jews and the Romans. Not two great choices, huh? Either you deny Christ, you know, totally identify with the synagogue, or you leave the synagogue, and then you become an object of persecution because Domitian now is trying to get these, these outside groups uh, to either worship him or pay the price. And remember, the Jews had this legal exemption. They didn't have to worship the emperor. They had their official religion. The Christians had no such exemption. And so that's why it explains why Christians, many of them, sought acceptance in the synagogue. All right, in Sardis, what it seems to happen now in Sardis, uh, the Jews had a very secure position in the community. Remember we saw that, uh, that overhead picture within the gymnasium, the gymnasium there, there was a synagogue there. So the Jews, and we talked about the long history of the Jews in Sardis, they were an integral part of the community there in Sardis. They were part of it, all right? And so they weren't on the outside looking in. And so they coexisted peacefully with the synagogue community, that is the Christians. But now um, things are happening where it's getting more and more difficult because the spiritual state they're in prevented them from trusting the Lord and withdrawing from the synagogue. But now with this curse and with the idea of Domitian, you know, trying to get these splinter groups who are, didn't have the official exemption for worshiping him, trying to get them to either worship or die. So the curse was introduced in AD 90 uh, uh, by certain Jews into what's called the 18 benedictions. And the idea was to root out the Christians from the synagogues, find them. All right, can we get it now, a picture of, there we go. Here's what the curse of the Menim said. 
may the Nazarenes and the Menim suddenly perish. And look what it says. And may they be blotted out of the book of life and not enrolled with the righteous. Sound familiar, the words? So the curse on being blotted out is not coming from God. It's coming from these Jews who want to root the Christians out of the synagogue. This was the curse placed upon them. This is the background we see here in Revelation 3, 5. So the people, the Christians now, were placed under a curse by certain Jews where their names would be blotted out of the synagogue registry of the faithful. In other words, the synagogue kept a registry of the faithful people, and the Christians' names were in there alongside the Jews. Now, unless you're a Jew, unless you reject Christ, your name is going to be blotted out of the synagogue registry, which is the same thing as being blotted out of God's book of life. Not only death, but also the book of life, because they considered the names in the synagogue registry, the faithful Jews, their names were also written in heaven. So the threat was, if you leave the synagogue, your name's not only going to be wiped out of our roles, but God's going to wipe out your names too. So these Christians who were threatened with physical and spiritual death were assured by Jesus that they would not be blotted out of the book of life, no matter what the cursed threatened. Okay, so you see the background here with this particular curse. This is what they're facing. This has started to, to circulate in the Roman Empire. They made the Nazarenes, all right, and the Menim suddenly perish. These are the believers in Jesus. And may they be blotted out of the book of life and not enrolled with the righteous. All right, so this explains now what we talked about two weeks ago about we find the Lord twice telling believers, once in Smyrna, once in Philadelphia, of those who called themselves Jews, but they're actually what? The synagogue of Satan. So what the Lord is saying in Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9, uh, he said again, I know your works, your tribulation and your poverty, this is to Smyrna, but you are rich, and the blasphemy of those calling themselves are saying that they are Jews and they are not, but they're actually of the synagogue of Satan. So these people who were making this curse against the Christians in that day, these Jewish people in the synagogue, the Lord says, not only am I going to not blot your name out, your name is indelibly written, these people are doing it. They're not Jews. They're of the synagogue of Satan because a true Jew would believe in, 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 in Jesus. It would believe in me because Jesus has given the letter. So this has nothing to do, not a zero with loss of salvation or anything like that, and so the overcoming here is the light of tease, meaning your name is indelibly written in the book of life. It's the strongest way of making a promise. It has nothing to do about, you know, saying the opposite might be true, nothing whatsoever. It's a promising assurance to believers who are walking with the Lord, who are worthy. It is not a threat. So the threat doesn't come from the Lord here. The threat comes from these unbelieving Jews trying to get the Christians out of the synagogue and cursing them. The curse is not from the Lord. That's why one commentator in the book of Revelation, Robert Mount, says, it is unsound to base theological doctrine solely on parables or apocalyptic imagery, close quote. Well, that's true. See, so many people see this phrase here. Oh, their names are going to, uh, I'm not going to write your names out of the book of life. So they assume the opposite is true. But no, this is the figure of speech, Lydates. It's just a way of saying, your name is in. We don't consider the opposite true. For example, we have Jesus saying, remember, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, here's a biblical example of Lydates, you won't be forgiven in this life or in the next life. All right. Well, does that mean if in the next life you don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you can be forgiven? No, it's a way of saying there's no forgiveness you'll have at all, either here or in the future, if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. So this verse is not a threat. It's a promise to the believers. It's responding to the threat was made by the unbelieving Jews. It has nothing to do with ones losing their salvation whatsoever. And so it, the Lord goes on to say, I will then I will also confess his name before my Father, declare his name before my Father, uh, this is the third promise that Jesus gives. In other words, they're going to walk with him in white. Their names are indelibly written, uh, written in stone in the book of life, and we will be confessed before his Father in heaven. All overcomers, everybody who believes in Jesus will be that. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, whoever confesses me before people, I will confess before my Father which is in heaven. So it's just, a, a, again, Jesus is... is basically reaffirming what he said during the Gospels in Matthew chapter 10. 
and before his angels. And so again, you've got the same in Luke 10, 8. Whoever confesses me before man, the Son of Man will confess before, his, before the angels of God. And so here's what's going on here. Here's the wonderful promise that these people, again, would, would see the illustration. They would be confessed before the sovereign of the universe, just as, and this is what happened in the first century Rome, in the presence of the emperor and his court, the victorious general would relate the deeds of the warriors. Okay, they have the Roman triumph. The general would come in before the emperor. He would relate the deeds of the warriors done in the exploits of battle, present these people before the court in acknowledgement of their worth. In the same way, the Lord Jesus is going to lead us in a triumph as he comes back of King of Kings and Lord of Lords, recount the deeds and presents us to God the Father as the faithful ones and recount our deeds, the ones that will last, and that's what we will be rewarded on as we uh, serve him and worship him in triumph. So this is a very much a triumphal verse about the victories we're going to get, being confessed before his angels, have our names indelibly written in the book of life. And finally, it says, the one who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, not just Sardis, but to all the churches. This message is as timely now as it was was written here in the first century. And so, for those who overcome, those who have trusted Christ, we're going to walk with him in white garments, all right? Our names are indelibly written in the book of life. And when there's this triumphal ceremony, when the Lord brings us in front of the throne there at the judgment seat of Christ, that's the reward seat of Christ. We're going to be following in triumph, and he's going to relate all our righteous deeds before him. And the emperor, as it were, the God the Father will reward us and such like. That's the good news to the few who have overcome there in the city of Sardis. So basically, to sum it up, like I said, we get done early tonight. To sum up Sardis, the worst of the seven churches, having a reputation for being vibrant, was actually spiritually dead. No encouraging words for the church as a whole. It was a city whose history and legend, as we saw, became proverbial. The Jews, as well as the Christians, were well aware of this. And we've seen a number of pointed allusions uh, in the letter, especially in verses 2 and 3. Remember, with Croesus, the rich king, how pride goes before a fall, a misplaced trust in riches, and a certainly a lack of vigilance, not, not thinking you know, his mountaintop uh, kingdom could ever be toppled, and it was. And so we also saw there was a large Jewish population in the city, and a number of references to Jesus' words as contained in the four Gospels when we're told in Sardis to watch the threat that he'll come as a thief, the promise I will confess him before the Father. These are all found as words of Jesus previously in the four Gospels, echoed there, and again found in the book of Revelation in the short letter to Sardis. And then situational links to further things we will see in the book of Revelation, Believers dressed in white, and we will return to the earth after we've been rewarded, after that triumph in front of God the Father, in white clothes. And it seems what's going on here, that the majority of the church had gained acceptance in the synagogue with the implicit denial of the name of Christ. That's why there's a play on this word name. They basically denied the name of Christ by hanging around being part of the synagogue there and not separating from from the Jews, as it were, not showing they're a distinct group of of people believing in Jesus. So the faithful few had seemingly faced deletion from the synagogue register, which was a serious matter under Domitian, because if you're not uh, with the synagogue register anymore, not listed as a Jew, then you either have to worship the emperor or you're going to be put to death. So however, they were assured, no matter what happened, it would be not deleted from the Lord's heavenly book, and they did not have to worry about threats from the synagogue of Satan. And folks, neither do we. Our names are indelibly written in the book of life. Get an amen for that? All right, Barry, come on up. (laughs) I don't have a question. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate both of you and all the time and effort and study you're putting into this revelation study for us and also what you do on pastor's perspective every day and we're on news briefing i enjoy all of it and i really appreciate it and feel blessed thank you carol thank you too kind thank you thank you yeah that was so awesome i just totally wish i could like pick your guys's brains like forever because it's so awesome (laughs) um (laughs) on the side note um so the other day I was listening to John Carson, and he was, he was talking about um, the treasures that we're storing in heaven, and yeah, they're going to be burned or whatever. But he was saying um, that what that is, is we're basically, um, how did he explain it? He explained it like um, 
that's what we're going to be allowed to do in heaven is by how our service to God now is, is going to be determined how we live in heaven. And he says something like, because the Bible says that God will wipe away our tears because we'll have remembrance of what we didn't do for him down here because of what we're not allowed to do there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. I, I think, you know, that uh, we were just talking about that. I think uh, mm -hmm. John R. Rice, uh, a preacher from a generation yeah. ago, did a sermon uh, some years ago called There Will Be Tears in Heaven. And some believe that, that uh, when you arrive in heaven because of that uh, particular reference, that God's going to wipe away all the things we regret, all the things we uh, remember that we should have done. And some even say that he'll wipe, wipe away the remembrance of loved ones who aren't there. Uh, otherwise, some make the case, how could heaven be heaven if you remember people that aren't there? Uh, you know, whether or not that's valid or not, I don't know. What we do know is that, you know, in heaven we've received crowns and, and rewards. And, you know, I think this is one of the things that's often a difficulty for a lot of people is to look at heaven and understand that there are rewards uh, in heaven that we receive. I think that is just so like Jesus. You know, he says, you can't do anything apart from me, but by me you can do all things. So he does things through us that we can't do ourselves and then rewards us for what he did. Uh, that's so like the Lord. But, uh, you know, I think we need to understand that there is hierarchy in heaven. There is a rank and file among the angels and they're identified very clearly. Uh, archangels and cherubim and other uh, ranking angels. We see this in Daniel, that there's an angel who has trouble with the prince of Persia and uh, he's lent a hand by the great prince, Michael. You know, so there are levels of power and authority in that sense. And, and I don't know that, that we could necessarily say that's not true for those who arrive. Uh, you know, we do know that every time, and I think this is interesting, every time you see mention of the second coming of Christ in the New Testament, there are verses associated with that that exhort us to be busy and to be working for the Lord because there are rewards in heaven. Yeah, 1 John 2.28 talks about some believers that will be ashamed at his coming because they won't have anything to present to the, the Lord Jesus. And it, the, one of my Bible teachers used the illustration of you, you build a new, I think I've given this before, you build a new house, you know, from the, the bottom up, a two-story house, you just finish finishing the last part of the second floor, you smell smoke at the bottom, you think someone's cooking something, and you look down, there's a fire there, and you realize the fire's coming up in the house, and so your only chance is to jump out the window, and you jump out the window as you jump out on the ground, you see the house dissolving in flames. Well, you're going to have mixed emotions, right? You're thankful you're alive, but you only, but everything you did has got burned up and wood, hay, stubble, and that's why we're exhorted, you know, to build on, you know, solid foundation there. First Corinthians six three says, "Don't you know you're gonna we're gonna judge angels, and judge in the sense we're gonna be have authority over the angels." And remember the parable Jesus gave have a authority over a few cities, many cities, five, ten, one, whatever it might be. It seems that is the rulership in the kingdom. What he's talking about here, and so. Um, yeah, it's, so the rewards are going to mean something. Gonna, but, you know, it's by our faithfulness to him. And so, yeah, there are rewards coming indeed. Hi. Okay, I have a question um, about Genesis 6, 1 through 4, where it talks about the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, of all whom they chose. And then further down in four, that the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. So I've heard a lot of stuff about this lately and I heard someone on K-Wave the other day talking about the um, angels coming into men or are they demon possessed men that now are having relations with the women on the earth? And is that how we got, like, the big giants that they talk about in the Bible? So I'm kind of confused because I'm hearing a lot of different things. So maybe you guys could clarify that. She's looking at you. Uh, <laughs> well, was this, was, was, was this, is this open, thing on? Well, no, my, my, my question was, I, I don't remember covering that tonight in Sardis. Uh, it's the book open of Revelation tonight. It's open. Oh, oh, it's open. Oh, it is. Yes, oh, yes. You said. Oh, that's right. We said that last week. You did. Somebody I wasn't back when I'm paying attention. It might have been me. All right. You, yeah, it was you. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so you went to Genesis 6, 1 to 4. I think I've told the story here. When I was uh, many years ago on staff at Calvary Chapel Spokane, I had a weekly Bible study, and we went through this uh, to do it thoroughly. It took me three and a half hours to go through all the possibilities. So um, I'll let Barry answer it then because uh, <laughs> he, he's more succinct. I'll take the first minute. You take the other two hours and 59 minutes. So, no, it's, you know, there's various opinions on this issue. And because of the reference that, you know, in Job where the sons of God came with Lucifer and, you know, that this is therefore the way you interpret these particular verses that they're angelic beings and they fell and uh, had sexual relations with women and a race of giants came from them. And, uh, you know, I think one of the arguments against that, uh, it's probably the soundest argument, is that there is no sexuality uh, to angels. And we're told in scripture that when we get to heaven, we'll be like the angels who neither marry nor are given in marriage. So, you know, the possibility of them coming and having sexual relations with women, I I don't think scripture necessarily supports that. You know, even though there's other places where sons of God are referenced to uh, men, and there's places where it's a reference to angelic beings. So... You want to add to that? Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's... It, you that was know, my minute. That was your minute? Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. People are... <laughs> I don't know where to begin. Um, yeah. First of all, you cannot solve the question based on the Hebrew language, the grammar, or the meaning of the words, because the phrase B'nai Elohim in Hebrew, or sons of God, uh, refers to both humans and angels, uh, all right? And Job is obviously angels, so what you have to do is let the context decide what it means. There is nothing whatsoever in the context that would give the slightest idea we're dealing with angels here, we're dealing with human beings. The Lord was upset with humans because they are flesh, his days, their days are numbered. When Jesus talked about the second coming, as in the days of Noah, the people were marrying and giving in marriage. It says these sons of God married. They took the daughters. They took them in marriage. An angel doesn't marry a human being. An angel doesn't have the plumbing to have children with a female <laughs> human being. Angels are sexless, deathless creatures. They are, they are spirit beings, Hebrews 1, 7 and 14. And so they don't, the potential is not even there. All right. Um, there's many, many other problems with it. Uh, again, the main one I have is this. You read the first chapter of the book of Job, and you find out that Job had to ask God, right? To, uh, Satan had to ask God to tempt Job, remember? Uh, Consider my servant Job, and you know, the Lord says to Satan, and he says, uh, Okay, yeah, you know, but you know, uh, you know, if I'll, can I, I want to tempt him, you know, I want to see, let's see how how good he is. And the Lord said, yeah, but don't take his life. So everything that happened to Job, we find, was something that the Lord allowed, right? And then God knew what Job could handle. So, would if you would say that these actually these fallen angels somehow could become, you know, to a state where they could marry women and produce children, this is angelic sin. This is not human sin. All right. And God would have to permit this, and then God would destroy the world because of the sin of angels. Angels aren't mentioned in this account whatsoever. Humans are, because they are flesh. Again, when Jesus talked about it, they were marrying and giving in marriage. Talk about human beings. Nothing mentioned of angels in the days of Noah and the second coming. And so I, I, the angel, I think that view is, is so wrong on many, many, many counts. Each, we, we, you know, each is created according to their kind. And, it's, and thank God you can have Terry Mortensen here. He's one of the best guys in the world on, on coming on the whole Bible and science stuff. And one of the things he mentions in his writings makes it very clear there's a you know, human kind, there, there's an angel kind, there's different animal kinds, and they can only uh, you know, reproduce after their own kind. God made it that way, but angels can't reproduce whatsoever, any way, shape, or form. So anyway, um, you know, well-meaning people you know, believe this, but I think, it's, I think it's really as wrong as rain. And here, the thing that really bothers me about this uh, there are people who actually make a cottage industry out of this. Talk about all the, they're looking for angels around. They're looking for, you know, um, I don't know if you remember the old, uh, you know, this will really date you, the TV program, The Invaders. Remember that in the 60s? David Vincent has seen them and they got the bad finger or something. They had the little finger they couldn't <laughs> write or whatever it is. 
And, um, and, and, you know, I've heard some of those, anyway, the ridiculous things over the years, the so-called prophecy teachers saying, and their whole message is, you know, we've got to look as angels have infiltrated the, you know, the human race, this and that. And so you end up looking at the guy next to you, wondering maybe they're, they're an angel, you know, it's taken on human form, you know. And so it's just, anyway, um, and that, okay, that kind of gives my overview of that. And we could document all of that, but uh, I obviously can tell, I don't think much of the angelic argument at all. I think there's way too many problems with it. So I'll stop now. No, that's a good <laughs> Thank God for God's grace and mercy Amen. Amen. that allows us to have our names yes. in the book of in, life. Indelibly. In, indelibly, yes. <laughs> That's our core curriculum. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do have a question about process, though. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 tells us that yes. for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. I, I, you know, I think I understand that, and yet uh, we're told that when we die, we go instantly to heaven. And, and I know the, the, understand the difference between body and soul, but I'm, I'm, quite, I'm kind of still perplexed by this. So could you give me an explanation, please? Okay. Well, the, the Bible obviously teaches a physical or a bodily resurrection, if you will, and you know, we do know, as Second Corinthians 5, 8 says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So that's a hard fact. That's what happens when you die. You are present with the Lord. In what state you're present with the Lord, we really don't know. We don't have a lot of information about that. Some hold to what's called the doctrine of the intermediate state. You know, there's a temporary body that those who are present with the Lord uh, would inhabit until they are, you know, put on the immortal incorruption uh, that they'll put on when the dead in Christ are raised. You know, some hold to that view, but uh, to my knowledge, Don, maybe you see it a little bit differently, but I don't know that there's any indication in Scripture as to what condition we are in uh, when we're present with the Lord until the resurrection. No, there's not, actually. There's three views that Christians hold. Some people hold that we get our glorified body upon death. That doesn't seem to f jive with Philippians 3 and a, a couple other places in Scripture when he returns or when he comes back for us, then we get the remodeling job. The body is, is made perfect in that. Uh, the temporary body, some people argue that as 2 Corinthians, or some say that we have no physical or corporeal form. Uh, the body's in the grave. We're in the unseen realm. Somehow, we, you know, we have substance there, even though we're spirit creatures, just like, you know, angels are and God is. They do well in the unseen realm somehow, and so why couldn't we? But then eventually we get a, a, a glorified body. And so we don't know. And, and what's interesting, the Scripture isn't that interested in it. It's not interested in the in-between state. It's interested in the eternal state, the body we're going to eventually have. We want to know what's going to happen one minute after we die, right? We want to know what we're going to get, and the Lord's considering what we're going to get a a thousand years from now. And by the way, contrary to what people think, when it talks about the dead in Christ rise first, it's not to talk about the Presbyterians rising first, being raptured before <laughs> anybody else is the dead in Christ. But we know there will be, you know, the elders in heaven, the Presbytery, there, there will be Presbyterians in heaven, but there's only 24 of them, we find out from Revelation. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Couldn't resist that one, sorry. Forgive me if you're Presbyterian. No, I'm not yeah. touching that. That's what you like that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, now, Don, I, I, I wasn't asleep during the presentation. <laughs> I heard everything. Okay. I just don't understand it. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> My wife said, I understand it perfectly, but we know that we're told that God uh, knows those who are going to be saved. Correct. You have the book of life, you have the book of living, and yet my understanding has been that at the beginning, God knows who's going to be saved. And so are yes. all names written in the book of life or the book of living or the book of something? And then they're removed because they never accept Jesus Christ as their own. Yeah, yeah. Well, some people argue that. That's one of the things that's, that's there. I, if I would have taken more time, that was one of the points I was going to mention. There's mm. a few verses in that. Mm. And that's possible. We don't know that. In other words, every name is written there and then rubbed out when they don't believe. But it talks about our names have been written there from the foundation of the world. Yes. Not because we've been chosen for, before the foundation of the world to believe, because the Lord knew who would believe. Yes. There's a big difference there. That's my yeah, confusion. That's, that's a big, you agree with that, Barry? Well, yeah, and I think, you know, that's where a lot of the confusion lies is that, you know, God's foreknowledge doesn't mean that God initiates, yeah. 
you know, that particular act. You know, we still have our free will. Sovereignty of God is, is not diminished at all by the free will of man. It's just a sovereign act of God to give man free will. And, you know, of course the Lord knows all things. He's mm. omniscient. Before the foundation of the world, he knew about you and I, mm. knew our names, knew that we would choose for him. But that doesn't, doesn't mean he forced us to choose. You know, he simply acted in his, in his foreknowledge or, you know, operates in his foreknowledge. And, uh, you know, so, you know, that interesting, you know, that uh, John tells us, First John tells us that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Mm -hmm. You know, and there are some who take that position that, you know, because Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, there's only one unpardonable sin, and that's to basically die without uh, accepting Christ as Savior and mm -hmm. Lord, that at that point in time, those who he died for, who could be saved, had their names blotted out of the book. I mean, that's, you know, an interpretation that some take. I don't think that's necessary. So every name is not written in the book of life or it is written in the book of life. That's what I'm trying we, to... We, we don't yes. know. Yeah, 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 yeah. The believers are, yeah, yeah. Right. There, whether there were other names written beforehand and rubbed out, we don't know. But Depends we do, on who you're talking to. Yeah, yeah. So it tell does, my it's wife not that, that clear. I'm not wrong. Would you please do that? But me? again, yeah. Um, God, God knows what's going to happen. He, he clearly... Uh, knows the future, but he always denies the responsibility for unbelief. He does, he's, he's, he's not the one to blame for people not believing. He'll deny the responsibility because it's our, our decision, but he knows what we're going to do, and that's, that's what the Bible teaches. Again, Jeremiah 32, 35, which he said, such a disgusting practice was something I, I did not command them to do. It never entered my mind, you know, to command them to do such a thing. So it wasn't God's call at all. Okay. My question is that... A little further close to the microphone. My question is in the Revelation 2015. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Right, Revelation 2015. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some people knock at my house and they try to tell me that there's no hair, that God is not so wicked that we just throw you inside the lake of fire. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, and that's very popular today amongst, unfortunately, formerly good churches. Barry, what about the people that are saying today there's no hell, a loving God will never throw anybody in the lake of fire? Somebody forgot to tell Jesus. Yeah. Um, you know, again, to, to say those two things, you know, are, are mutually exclusive or simply incompatible is incompatible with scripture because our God is a God of love and he is love in and of itself. Yet I think any of us can recognize rather quickly that, you know, as Hebrews tells us, you know, the Lord whom he loves, he chastens and he scourges every son whom he receives. And therefore we can recognize that there is a penial aspect of love, that we do punish our children uh, for the fact of teaching them right from wrong. It is a practice that God incorporates himself so, you know, I think if you just extrapolate that out fully into eternal judgment, then you can understand, you know, that this is the consequence of having rejected Jesus Christ. You know, for me, the, the, the argument is really kind of silly because the fact is God has done everything possible to save every soul that's ever lived. And people yet choose to reject him. You know, the Bible talks about a description like this. It describes it as a lake of fire and it's called the second death and you know it's a physical location it's not simply a state of mind you know it, it's not inconsistent with the nature of god you know you look at the description in, in uh, revelation 19 of jesus coming back you know his robe is dipped in blood and he judges and he makes war and he's a god of righteous judgment so you know i i think we need to be careful when somebody starts espousing these things that are basically in conflict with Scripture concerning a place like hell. This is one of my uh, verses that I always like to kind of lean on as well because there's a lot of things that are being talked about today. This is kind of a side note, a rabbit trail, if you will. You've got a movie out right now about somebody that went to heaven and allegedly saw these things, yet the Apostle Paul said he was caught up into the third heaven, you know, meaning the heavenlies and where God dwells. <clears throat> saw things that it'd just be sinful for him to even talk about or write down. So, you know, we need to be careful about such things and we need to be just as careful about people who have said that they've gone to hell. Because the reality is, 
Nobody's in hell yet. Hell comes after the great white throne judgment. Unbelieving dead still go to the place of torments or Hades. And it's only after the great white throne judgment, as we see here, that people are cast into the lake of fire for rejecting Jesus Christ. You receive Jesus Christ, your name's in the book of life. You reject him, your name's not in the book of life. So, you know, uh, let's just not allow TV and movies to give us our theology. I guess I could put it that way. Yeah. <clears throat> we're, um, we're told we're patiently waiting for our blessed hope. And what is our blessed hope? The glorious appearing of who? Our great, great God, God and Savior. 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 What does the idea of Savior mean? You're saved from something, Hell. right? Saved from judgment, saved from hell. Jesus came to be our savior, to save us from our sins. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Death, not only physical death, but eternal death, eternal separation. Thank God for his unspeakable gift because our names are indelibly written in the book of life. You're never going to forget that, are you? Okay. Well, that brings up a good point because if, you know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, yet all who are born still die. It has to be the second death Sometime that we're saved from. Different type of death. So that means there is a second death. Mm -hmm. And how can those who do not experience a second death and those who do experience a second death inhabit the same place for eternity? Yep. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, I hate to continue on this salvation book of life thing, but it's just not crystal clear yet. If in one of the letters it said, you, lo you left your first love, and then repent. So if they don't repent, they're not getting into heaven. No, 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 no. Okay, and then the like the lukewarm people, they get spit out. So it's just like okay, yeah, it's real simple. You're either saved or you're not, right? It, it's right. simple. You're you're either in or you're out. If you're saved, you're saved. You have eternal life, right? Okay, how long is eternal life for? Forever. Okay, then you've got it. Now okay. we're talking about rewards. You'll have something, a little bit, a lot, or nothing. But you're still a believer. If you're a believer in Christ, you're a believer in John 5:24. It says, to, "Jesus said the believers already have crossed over, passed from death into life." The, the disciples said, "Excuse me." So here's people who are alive, the disciples of Jesus, that already crossed over, passed from death into life. They already had eternal life. Eternal life is defined for us in John 17:3 that we may know you, uh, Jesus, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. It's a relationship we have with God. It begins the moment we trust Christ as our Savior. So it's an eternal relationship. We don't lose that. We can lose rewards, but you can't lose eternal life. Otherwise, it's not eternal life if you if it's not eternal. And these lukewarm people, who are they? Well, different thing. The di yeah, okay. it's a whole different thing. Now, it depends upon the person. Is a person truly a believer? Uh, again, that's something only God knows. He will judge righteously, Revelation, uh, excuse me, Acts 17, 31. But see, if, if, if we're going on a works righteousness basis, all right, here's the problem. First John 5, 12 says, the, he who believes in the Son of God has life. He who does not believe in the Son of God does not have life. These things are written, First John 5, 13, that you may no. know that you have eternal life. You've believed in the name of the only begotten Son. If you believe, you have eternal life. That's God's word, period. You know, okay? It's not a works, because if it's works, then you couldn't know, could you? Up until the day you die, because if I'd done enough works, God help us. I mean, uh, anybody, uh, first, back 1 Corinthians 10, 12, which we talked about two weeks ago at, at Sardis, mm -hmm. anybody thinks they stand, better take heed unless they fall. Anybody that thinks they, you know, on third base or rounding third as a Christian haven't got out of the batter's box yet because you don't realize how far we, each of us has to go. And so uh, uh, your thoughts on that, Bear? I just, you know, I just, I really, really want to emphasize, you've trusted Christ. You're his. You're a child of God. That, so, that's the promise forever, period. I think, too, you have to recognize that uh, leaving your first love is not synonymous with losing your no, salvation. No. Okay. And the church in Laodicea is a whole different animal. Because one of the, you know, and I'll be thankful when we get there because we can clear up some of the things that we often uh, think and understand and, and take verses out of context and quote. But if you look at, you know, Revelation 3.20, Jesus is on the outside of this church not going to get in. Okay. You know, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll let him in. You know, so, um, or I'll come in. So, you know, again, trying to draw the parallel between the church at Ephesus who had become mechanical in their service to God. And this was a letter to a church. 
You know, in other words, church, if you don't get back to loving me and that being the primary motive for the functions within the church, then this church is going to become ineffective. You know, and I'm, I'm going to do away with this church. And we know, as Don said, you know, that the church did indeed uh, mm -hmm. extend well for another 500 years. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, where you've around. got the Laodicean age of the church, yeah. you know, it's a whole different matter. Okay. You know, Jesus uses very descriptive terms there. You know, I would rather that you were cold or hot. And as we get there, we'll find out he's communicating in a way that was culturally understandable because of the thermal springs and other things we'll so they hear about really when we get Christians. there. So they really right. Okay. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't use that kind of language to the Christian. I'll okay. spew you out of my mouth or vomit you out of my mouth. You know, I one, I think when we look at it, especially my go-to verse is always Ephesians 1, you know, where we, we are told that we've been given a down payment or a guarantee exactly. of our inheritance when we received the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, if you can't trust in that guarantee, then you can't trust in anything. Okay, so yeah. these first love people in that letter, they were just messing up, but they're yeah. saved. They're just messing oh, up. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, Christians mess up all the time. I remember that one time I did. It was just, you know. You did once 10 years ago, right? You remember, yeah, yeah. I remember 10 minutes ago, okay. Just, just for clarification, it's always funny when you have to bring up something your mom tells you when you're a kid and, and look at the wisdom in it. But for me, if I'm understanding it correctly, because this is always one that's always kept me on that pay attention route. Um, my mom used to say, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being a, saying you're a cookie and sitting in a cookie jar makes you a cookie. Um, and I think that's possibly what's going on here is Jesus is saying, hey, look, if you're a Christian, there's going to be signs of that. And your heart's going to be there. If you're not a Christian, if you've got somebody going, hey, this is insurance, I'll just, say, I'll just go to church this week. Now I've got my insurance, and then I'll go to the Buddhist temple next week, so I've got my insurance for that. I think that's really what's, what it's boiling down to. That person is not sold for Jesus. And I think that's what the determination is. Uh, when you're looking at Mormonism and some of these other things, it's using a name that really isn't Christ. If I'm, if I'm understanding it correctly, that's what the warning's about. You looking at me? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, yeah, was that a question? Um, you know, I think just this brings about a good point because one, I, I know this is gonna come up, you know, about the behavior of a Christian and, and uh, you know, as they move forward, having been saved, you know, what about those who who do not have any reflection of Christ-likeness in their life, yet they made a profession of faith, they raised their hand, prayed a prayer, walked out on a field, you know, whatever it may be. What about those who started well, were involved in church, and then they didn't continue, you know, those kind of things. And, you know, did they have a faux faith, uh, you know, or were they just acting, or did they enjoy the experiential moment, you know, or, or you know, what happened to them? Did they actually lose their salvation? All those kind of things are questions that come up. But, you know, once again, I, leaning on Scripture, I think 1 John 3, 9 says, He who is born of God is not content to continue in sin. You know, so there it is right there. And when somebody starts, and I've always liked to, to make the distinction like this. You know, when people are asking about somebody who's made a profession of faith, went down on the field, or did, did whatever they, they did, then they ought to be able to take the test of 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourself to see if you're really of the faith. Well, what are you gonna look for? You're gonna look for the fruits of the Spirit. You're going to look for the things that are given to believers. You know, you're going to look for the doctrines that, that you hold to. And I think the real distinction, especially when people make a profession of faith, but then they live like they've never met Jesus. You know, the, re the reality is this. When you sin as a Christian and you feel guilty, that's the Holy Spirit in you. Mm -hmm. When you sin and say you're a Christian and defend your sin, the Holy Spirit is not in you. Yeah, Don, you use the term Palestine in reference to the first century. Now, it's my understanding it wasn't until the second century with Hadrian that uh, 135 AD, if I remember correctly, that Palestine was coined by him. Is that right? Or am I, did, missing I don't know. Did I use the word tonight? I don't remember doing yeah, it. Yeah, you Fine did when enough. you were talking about Sardis in 90 AD. 
I did? Okay. Yes, uh, it's 132, yeah, well, and you're right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. The land of the Philistines is what it was called, Adrian, because that was after they plowed under Jerusalem, they built the, that. Yeah, um, it's an anachronism, you know, it's uh, using it, just like saying, anyway, yeah, um, it was, it was, it's the Holy Land, but it was called that. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I could go on, but we'll just leave it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, Hi. Uh, about God's uh, foreknowledge of uh, the people who will accept Christ and also um, free will in terms of people uh, being able to accept Christ or not. Um, how does that, because the Bible talks a lot about uh, predestination and election as well, right? So, um, for example, uh, Romans 8, uh, 29, uh, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Uh, so, keep reading. Keep reading. Uh, predestined. <laughs> to what? <laughs> to be conformed to the image of his son. That's right. Okay. That's what the predestination is. Okay. So, Not to it, eternal life. Uh, you never find an individual predestination to eternal life. The predestination is to be conformed to the image of his son, or, you know, for, and as Ephesians uh -huh. chapter 1 says, too, mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're before the foundation of the world to become like him. Mm -hmm. uh, that's our ultimate goal, but that's not the same as salvation. That's salvation in the future tense. Yeah. We have been justified when we come to Christ. We are being set apart, sanctified. We will be the future tense, glorified. Mm -hmm. That's Romans 8, 29. That's your future and my future, and that's the good news. We're going to be like him. But that's where we're predestined to, to be like Christ, not okay. because not to pre be predestined for salvation or damnation. Uh, because once you get into that, that whole mess, well, Barry, what happens when you do that? Well, you come up with a lot of problems. Yeah. You know, there's scripture problems all over the place. Uh, one of the, we talked a little about this last week about Cain and Abel, but also one of the things I think that uh, pokes a hole in that whole uh, belief system is David, you know, when he had sinned with Bathsheba and his son was, was dying and uh, he had prayed for him <clears throat> and then he had, you know, uh, heard his servants talking or saw them talking, realized the child was dead. And mm -hmm. then he got up and cleaned himself up, ate a meal, and went about his business and, and made the proclamation that, you know, his son could not come to him, but he would go to where his son is. Now, how would he know that? Mm -hmm. How would he be able to make the determination that his son was one of the elect mm -hmm. if it's just simply God's choosing at birth before anyone is ever born, who's going to be saved and who is not. David seemed to be under the uh, understanding that when a child dies, that child goes to heaven. Does that mean all children are elect? Well, if that's true, then how do they become unelect? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That makes yeah. sense? Yeah. Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, Roman, yeah, yeah <laughs> if he, if, if Ephesians 1. I thought so. <laughs> I, no, I think so. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 4 again, chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, what, that we might be holy and unblemished or blameless in his sight. That's what he's chosen us to be, holy and unblemished, not a, a, a choice for salvation or damnation. Otherwise, you're going to have huge, huge problems, huge problems in Scripture. while back okay yeah well if there's yeah, uh, do you have a question also uh, just kind of uh, more general um, how how do you reconcile um, man's free will with uh, God, God's sovereignty well you know as far as the predestination free will issue especially you know I always kind of lean back on Spurgeon somebody asked him how do you how do you reconcile free will and predestination and he said why do you reconcile friends you know, they're both on in Scripture, so there's no reconciliation needed. You know, I think it's just an understanding of, you know, one, again, you know, God and his sovereignty, that doesn't mean that God dictates every action of every human being who's ever been born. And this is what the Reformers believe, that God initiates everything evil and everything good. And I don't believe that, nor do I hold to the deist position where God just simply put everything in motion and backed away and he's uninvolved. You know, the Scripture doesn't support that either. And I think the reality is in the middle. God and his sovereignty gave man. And the fact is, I, you know, I think I've kind of used this illustration before. You know, you can't make anybody love you. You know, ask any junior higher. You know, <laughs> you can't make anybody love you. You can be crazy about somebody, but you can't force them to love you. And since God's desire is to have a loving relationship with his creation, it is of necessity that he give them free will to choose to love him because love is always a matter of choice. Otherwise, it's just robotic. And then we would be just like the angels. You know, but even them, you know, they 
had the free will uh, to rebel against God. So, you know, I don't think there's any reconciliation really needed. I think there's just understanding. Yeah, Jesus weeps over the city of Jerusalem in Matthew 23, 37. How often I wanted to gather her children as a mother hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Well, uh, he assumed they had a choice, right? Otherwise, it's a charade, him crying over the city of Jerusalem for rejecting him if they've been foreordained before the foundation of the world to reject him. Doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, does it? And so um, th those are real tears because they could have accepted him. That was, when you, you say someone was willing but they didn't do it, that means they had a choice, right? And from beginning to end, the Bible, we have a choice. Choose this day who you'll serve. If the Lord be God, choose him. If words mean anything, like Barry said, the word loves mean anything, that implies choice. And so that, that rules out the idea of, you know, God, you know, picking this one and not picking this one before the foundation of the world. God chose the method of salvation to be the blood of Jesus Christ. Right. And whoever believes in that can be saved. Yeah. In his sovereignty, he chose yes. that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Gave us a choice. Thank you very much, you guys, for helping us to go through all our struggles here. And because the scripture is does kind of blow your mind. So help me in the sense of trying to work through this. I'm, when I hear like the wheat and the tares, and then the angels coming to pick them up and stuff, I'm thinking of all the tares screaming out, but I believe, but I believed. And, and so sometimes it seems so easy just to say, well, if you believe, then you're saved. But we know that other scripture that says even the demons believe and tremble. So to me, in, in the little bit that I know, I'm going, okay, here seems like the two things that are really going to help us. Because when you say examine yourselves, it seems like the Sermon on the Mount, that deep brokenness, and then all the transgressions of that one. Um, not transgressions, but all that, how it moves on. And then it seems like the next one when we're talking about works would be the parable of the soils. So we have the last soil, and I always used to really, it used to really bug me when I used to go like, what does it mean when it says that the, the, the seed was thrown out, but then it gave fruit of some 30, some 30, some 60, some 120? And when I tried to my best of my abilities, I don't know that I got it right, but it, it was supposedly an agrarian term, meaning that if you threw your seed out, and you got a 7.5 return, that was like an average return. But if you got a 10%, that was a bumper crop, or bumper crop. But if you got 30, 60, 120, that was like the Lord was so in you that you just works are just coming out of you like out of, the, out of the ground come a bubble and crude, it's just And so I'm, I'm trying to put that together, the whole, the whole works and the parable of the soil. And because he keeps saying, I know your works, I know your works, and so I, I think I kind of got it, but I don't think I do. So help me. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. No, this one's you. <laughs> we're actually we're over the time here, and I know we are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and my answer would be quite long and drawn okay. out on this one. Yeah. It's an illustration. You know, one. I think we need to understand that our responsibility ends at sowing, and that's it. We're seed scatterers. You know, everything else is God's responsibility. You know, that word, I think the illustration tells us, you just throw out the seed. You don't worry about the soil. You don't worry about if it's rocky, if it's hard, or if it's receptive soil. Because as you scatter seed, there's going to be some who receive it. You know, you're going to see these kind of manifestations among those who receive the seed. Some it will just bounce off, you know, and they're, you know, rejected immediately. Others, you know, it'll spring up. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. I want to be a part of that. And then, you know, trials come through life and they fall away. You know, and then you're going to find the seed that, that, you know, is prosperous. But, again, it's an illustration. You know, it's not, uh, it, it's teaching us in that sense, but it's not initiating a practice outside of the fact that we're to be, we're to be seed sowers. You know, the tares, we talked about that a few weeks ago. You know, there's always going to be tares in the church. And we always have to remember that tares can become wheat. Yep. Wheat can't become tares. Mm -hmm. No. But tares can become wheat. So that's why we don't uproot them and throw them out. But I'm not saying it so much in that sense. I'm saying it in the sense that that one last soil that was saved, when they are sowing, doesn't that numerical reference meaning that they're getting a bumper crop because they're spirit, they're spirit filled? And, and if I'm totally tweaked, then then wouldn't doubt me. I mean, wouldn't I wouldn't surprise me. Well, you know, if you want to if you want to move it into that realm, then we just have to look at it as a number of seeds sown. You know, because we don't have the capacity to dictate the the end result. You know, that's not up to us. You know. You can scatter. You look at Jeremiah. I mean, 50 years of preaching. How many converts did he have? Okay. Yeah. Zero. I, I guess I'll leave it on this last question. I guess hermeneutics is all about, it's what, that's what we're all here about, right? To try to get it, what it really means in the context. And if it's really an agrarian thing, 
doesn't that go back to don't those numbers really mean something as far as like the agrarian thing and and maybe that's just me trying to get too much out of something that too much. It's me I think you just answered okay. the question. Right okay, now. that's cool. That's cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Well, All right. I guess we're out of time, so we better get rolling. So uh, thank you guys. God bless you. Salvation, the most important decision of your life, is as simple as ABC. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 A. Admit that you are a sinner. Here's the bad news. We all have a problem. It's called sin. Our lives are not how God intended them to be. The consequence of sin is eternal death. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.23 B. Believe in Jesus Here's the good news. God gives us so much that He can forgive any sin, no matter how big or how small. God sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross to save us from sin. Jesus said that if you put your trust in Him, you will have eternal life. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. John 6.40 C. Confess that Jesus is Lord When Jesus rose from the grave, He proved His victory over eternal death. God wants you to confess that Jesus is Lord of all. He is your Savior. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10.9 I suggest praying the following prayer to accept Christ as your Savior. Dear God, I know I am a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus Christ is your Son. I believe that he died for my sin, and that you raised him to life. I want to trust him as my Savior, and follow him as Lord. From this day forward, guide my life and help me do your will. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to the Forever Family of God.